You are listening to The Squeeze on YouTube with Anthony Pasquazi. No Alec Rude here today. Different setting. We're in the same room as we were two weeks ago, but only on YouTube. And uh, only my voice <laughs> is what you'll be hearing today. I don't really know. Normally, I have Alec to look at, so that's where I put my eyes. I don't know whether to look directly into the camera, look at myself, which is always a little bit off-putting, or just look somewhere off into the distance. Let's just say I... Uh, I can't wait until I have a guest in here to talk to. Those guests will be at 1015, Nicole Thompson. She's the fastest girl on the field whenever she's out there. She's a freshman midfielder on the women's soccer team. Then we have Frankie Bacalars, friend of the show, contributor every single week. He's coming in at 1050. And then at 1115, a supporter of the squeeze, longtime supporter of the squeeze, pretty much since he's been a St. Mary's recruit. Liam Boyle will be in at 11.15, another freshman midfielder for the men's soccer team. A lot of exciting things happening today. Sadly, Alec wasn't able to join us. He hit me up last night, said that he was going to have to remain home for the show today. So we will carry on. We will go back to the roots of what the squeeze was when it first uh, started in that little KSMR studio two years ago, which is crazy to think about my freshman year, the squeeze, just me sitting in a radio booth for two hours alone every week, barely any guests. I don't know how I did it. I wish I recorded more of those shows so that I could go back and listen to them because uh, we've come a long way since then. We didn't even have a logo back then, to be honest. So now we have t-shirts. We got the whole shebang. We got a YouTube. That YouTube is Anthony Pasquazi. It's the only way that you can watch the show for the moment. Hit that like and subscribe button if you haven't already. The chat function is typically useful. It will be less useful today as no one is there to look at it because Alec Root is not with us. I will do my best during breaks to check in on the chat. There will be a time at 1130, around 1130, that I open up the chat to you guys because I want to have a conversation with the viewers. It's a little stressful to keep the YouTube page open because I'm staring at my face, <laughs> which is not exactly ideal, especially because it's on a little bit of a delay. But this is our first show back in two weeks, my first show back in two weeks. As I went home last weekend to Chicago, I drove all the way down to Iowa City, and then I drove all the way over to Chicago, about seven and a half hours in total. Stayed the weekend at home, had some pork chops, had some steak, some potatoes, some asparagus, had nice hearty meals. And then my grandfather, John Van passed away in July. We had his memorial service on Sunday. It was a beautiful service. It truly was a celebration of life. Um, anytime anybody is uh, no longer on the earth, it's a sad time. But there were some cheers, some tears shed on Sunday. But for the most part, it was a it was a happy celebration. I had no idea, really, and I, I said it to a lot of people at the service. I had no clue that my grandpa was as cool as he was, and. A lot of people probably experienced that. He had deteriorating health ever since I was 11 years old. So, you know, my adult years, my teen years were a lot of a shell of what Grandpa John used to be. And it was really cool to talk to all these people who loved him and got to know him. And, and you know, they knew him. They knew him. And I finally felt like I really got to know him after that memorial service. So we're back now. I then drove all the way back to Iowa City, and then up through the back roads of Minnesota and Iowa, which was one of the most stressful experiences I've ever had in my life. The fog rolled in. I felt like I was going to die about three different times, but we made it. We're back on the squeeze. And I had a great weekend personally, and so did Alec. The squeeze is becoming a little bit of a a trampoline for the careers of both myself and Alec Rude. The reason he went home this weekend was because he is helping to scout Minnesota high school hockey for the New Jersey Devils, which is amazing because that's exactly what Alec Rude wants to do in life. High school hockey is his passion. I think he would he would say the same thing if he was sitting with me here today. So for him to go out and have those opportunities to scout high school players it's a really big deal for him. So I'm very happy. And then me, my big thing that happened this weekend was on Friday night. I had my play-by-play -play debut on HBC. 
the extra point, which is a tape delay broadcast of high school football. It'll broadcast a couple times this week. And I was the play-by-play guy. We had a rookie play-by-play guy. We had a rookie director and then a man who was telling the rookie director how to do the work. So it was very, I mean, I felt like I was on the moon at first. Before the game even started, I called my dad and I simply went, I'm way over my head. (laughs) There are so many advertisements and reads and going to commercial and just so many different things to juggle that I had never had to, to do before. I did an okay job. We'll see. I'm not sure if I want to go back and watch it. I'm sure I'll end up doing so on HBC 25, but Hey, it was a paid gig and it was the first one that I ever had. So officially a uh, professional play-by-play guy. So another thing that is uh, moving in the direction of furthering both of our careers, Alec Root and mine, is we're both now employees at Layton Broadcasting, which is the radio broadcasting station studio company here in Winona, Minnesota. We're both employees there. We're both part-time working board operations. And that, you know, it's pretty cool because this is this is what I want to do. I want to do radio and I finally have a job in radio. I don't exactly know where that is going at the moment. So just remember, for all you Squeeze fans out there, I know this is your favorite part of your Sunday. It's not NFL football. It's not church. It's the Squeeze with Anthony Pasquese and Alec Rude. We will still be here in any form. I don't know what form yet. There are some things up in the air that I'll talk to you about as I I figure them out. But I promise you every Sunday from here on out, the squeeze will be on the air. We are going to be a St. Mary's sports show because that is what we've been. We've carved out a nice little niche, and I think we're going to keep it going because it's too it's too big to quit now. If you really look at it from what it used to be two years ago to what it is now, it's too big to fail, okay? Too big to fail. 60 subscribers on YouTube. I want to thank you guys because I saw that this morning. We hit that big 6-0, which is awesome. I mean, it, it probably won't happen for a while, but how great would it be if all 60 of you at the same time got up on the stream and I was talking to 120 ears unless we have some – Van Gogh's out there. I don't know. Maybe I have some listeners with only one ear. Makes listening to the squeeze a little more difficult, but I'm happy that you persevere and you listen every week. I don't know. 120 years? Probably, but you never know. So, (laughs) wow, this is so weird. (laughs) Talking, if you really just want to zoom out and think about what you guys are watching right now, at least normally I'm having a conversation with a person in the room, so it's a little less weird. But if you were standing outside that door here in Toner, you'd look in here and you'd just see a dude talking into a microphone alone looking at a camera. I look; It looks bizarre, I'm sure, zooming out. And you guys are listening to a person who is just rambling on and on and on. So I, it's, we can all question where we are at 10.08 on a Sunday morning. I'm happy you're with me. And I'm happy to be here. Something happened last Sunday other than me driving seven and a half hours to get back to Winona. And that something was the Chicago Bears looked terrible yet again. Mitch Trubisky, the worst quarterback in the NFL. Uh, He's fallen from grace in just about everybody's eyes. But the Bears found themselves a kicker. And that kicker's name is Eddie Pinero. If not for Eddie Pinero, the Bears right now would be 0-2. And we all know pretty much about the odds of making the playoffs when you're a team that starts the season 0-2, and and they are not good. But Eddie Pinero, a 40-yard field goal, a 52-yard field goal, and then as my brother and I were getting back in the car after stopping at an oasis in Illinois, we hear the call, Jeff Joniak on the radio calling Eddie Pinero's 53-yard field goal. Now, this was after the Denver Broncos go for two, then have a false start penalty, so they move back to take a one-point conversion, a point after kick. The Bears are then called offsides, giving the Broncos another opportunity to take the two-point conversion, which they then successfully convert, giving them a one-point lead over the Chicago Bears. Mitch Trubisky, in an offense that had been struggling all, in an offense that had been struggling all game to do anything pretty much marched its way down the field. Mitch Trubisky hits Allen Robinson for a 25 yard pass with time ticking down on the clock. There's one tick left. Matt Nagy calls the timeout and Eddie Pinero 
lines up and hits a 53 yard field goal that saved the bears. They got a win in Denver, something that hadn't happened for eight years. I believe it's been eight years since the team walked into Denver in September where the weather is hot and steamy and actually had a victory. So the Denver Broncos, not a very good team. The Bears at the moment don't look to be a very good team. I think we can all say that they're more talented than how they've played thus far. They squeaked one out, and I was happy to see it. I know a lot of Bears fans were happy to see it. The Packers looked pretty good until they didn't. The Vikings looked pretty bad until they didn't. I think this division is up for grabs. Packers are 2-0 and at the top of the division. Then you have the Vikings 1-1, and the Bears 1-1, and and then – the Lions one and one, I believe, as well. Who really cares about the Lions? I don't. I don't think anybody else does. It's a three-team division, and that's what it's going to be all season long. So that was a good thing for me, the Chicago sports fan, that happened, you know, this week. We'll see what happens on Monday night against the Redskins. Hopefully, Mitch Trubisky goes off for six touchdowns, just like he did last year in week five against the Buccaneers. I'm not starting him on my fantasy team until Lamar Jackson explodes because that man has been doing great work. Mitch Trubisky may be the namesake of my uh, Trubisky business team, but I will not be starting him because he has proved absolutely nothing to me. He is 32nd in the league in what passing yards, net efficiency rating. He's 33rd in the league. Mind you, there are only 32 teams. 33rd in the league in touchdowns with zero, so... I have as many touchdowns. You have as many touchdowns. Some of you out there, if we have any NFL players listening, may have more NFL touchdowns than Mitch Trubisky because he has zero. He's been the worst quarterback that I've ever seen. He's been the worst quarterback in the NFL this season. And Bears fans are very, very worried. Now, we are jumping to conclusions a bit. It's only two games. He didn't play in the preseason, but we were told all off season long that Mitch Trubisky had finally began to learn this offense and get to the 202 level of learning. No longer the 101, which was last year. That 101 brought the Bears to a 12 and 4 record and a first round playoff loss. So you would think 202 offense, a little more complex. Mitch Trubisky has a little more autonomy. You would think that I just got a text. You would think that Mitch Trubisky would would be better, and he hasn't been. So I think that's why Bears fans have been so scared. But hey, one and one through two games, two games that we probably should have lost, not we. I'm not on the Chicago Bears. That the Chicago Bears probably should have lost. And that's the Bears. Now we go to the Baby Bears. I hope, I hope, I hope this is the last time that I have to talk about my favorite sports team in the history of the world. I hope it's the last time I have to talk about them for the remainder of this squeeze season. They win. This is exactly what happened. I told you this was going to happen two Sundays ago. Cubs fans, they were going to get your hopes up. They were going to perform really well. And there was no really point. There was no real point in watching it for me because I knew it was all a facade. I knew it was all a mirage. They were going to play well. They were going to get themselves in a position to win the division, to go to the wild card game, to do anything. And then they were going to lose in the wild card game, is what I said. And that's exactly what they did. They scored 56 runs in four games, three against the Pirates, one against the Reds. They won five straight games and since have lost five straight games, two to the Reds and then three to the Cardinals. They play the Cardinals at 120 today. Four of those five losses have been one run losses. The one last night came off of two Cardinal home runs off of the lockdown closer, Craig Kimbrell in the ninth inning. The Cubs did it to us again, boys. We thought they were different, and they weren't. And it hurts. Because like I said, the Cubs are my favorite team to follow, to watch. And down the stretch this season, I didn't watch them at all. I kept up. I followed. I read the articles. I listened to the sports radio. But I didn't watch the games because it was too Frustrating to see a team that was this uber talented, that had a run differential that was third best in the National League all season long, a team that you knew had the best players in the division. They had the best rotation. They had the best lineup. Maybe they didn't have the best player, Christian Yelich, but they had the next three best players in Baez, Contreras, Bryant, even Rizzo was up there. But then the injuries hit. 
The bullpen was terrible all season long. You can go and look at the blown saves record, a record pace that they got off to in the first three months of the season. The bullpen fell apart. And when your bullpen falls apart, your team can fall apart. And that's exactly what happened this year. They're going to finish with a record of what? 10 games over 500. They're not even going to make the wild card game. And if you would have told me that six months ago, I would have slapped you in the face and called you a liar. Cause I didn't think there was any way that a team this talented wouldn't even qualify for the second wild card spot in the national league. I don't really know what the point of this was. It was pretty much just me ranting about my favorite team and how they struggled all season long. I'm not losing faith in this core as a whole. I'm not losing faith in this window as a whole. I think they'll be back out there next year. Hopefully they make a couple moves, a couple large moves to really shake up that locker room. I'm not the expert. I guess I'm supposed to be, but I'm not. I don't know what they're going to do. I hope they do something and I'll be right back out there next year. I, I, I came in to my room yesterday and I just screamed, I hate the Cubs. I hate them. And Brandon Carrillo, my roommate, just laughed. And I said, and you know what? I'll be back out there 10 times next year to Wrigley Field because that's what being a Cubs fan is. That's what being a Cubs fan was for 108 years. And that's what it might be for the next 108 years. You just, we'll get them next year. Next year is the year. Right after after the break, a little short break, we're going to take right here. Nicole Thompson of the women's soccer team at St. Mary's will be in to talk about her freshman campaign thus far and her team's rather upsetting conclusions to games these last two times out. So we'll be right back on the squeeze. Thank you for listening. We'll be right back. You are listening to The Squeeze here on YouTube under the channel name Anthony Pasquazy. I'm Anthony Pasquazy. This is Nicole Thompson. Nicole Thompson is a freshman out of Riverside, California. She's a biology major. And I said it earlier in the show, she is the fastest person <laughs> on the field almost every time out there. So Riverside, California, how in the world did you end up in Winona, Minnesota? Um, mostly just from soccer. Um, Neil Cassidy, the coach, recruited me off of a showcase in Colorado. Oh, wow. Yeah, so he's been following me since my sophomore year of high school and just been super, like, just keeping up to date with me, not even, like, pressuring me to come here until, like, my senior year. He's like, do you want to visit? And so when I came on my visit, I, like, really loved the family atmosphere and everything. And so I just kind of fell in love with the school, decided to come here. Yeah, that's awesome. So have you uh, felt like you made the right decision so far? Yeah, I do. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. And uh, 
A lot. It's it's interesting. The women's soccer team has more West Coast people than I think any yeah. team here. So Neil Cassidy, do you know why he decides to recruit so much out of state? Um, there's a lot of good soccer um on the West Coast, definitely, especially in like California states like Arizona, like West Coast soccer. I know is different, and there's more of like um a like dense like uh player field to to go off of so like in minnesota it'd be more spread out mm. but if he comes over to the west coast you'd be able to see more players in a like shorter amount of time so i think that's why he he goes over to like the colorado showcase people come from all over america there and there's a lot of people from the west coast obviously because it's in like more western mm -hmm. regions so yeah yeah so I St. Mary's soccer, to put it bluntly, has not performed very well, uh, at least since I've been here and definitely before I got here. But Neil Cassidy ha is turning the program around. And I think a lot of that has to do with the West Coast recruits. You opened up your Mayak play with a heartbreaking game against St. Kate's. I was there. You were obviously there. <laughs> so tell me what happened. You lost two to one. Tell me what the team felt after such a heartbreaking loss. Um, I think... Definitely coach felt frustrated. All of us felt kind of like definitely down after a loss, but we felt that we were like right there. Like we could have won the game. And then the last like few minutes, us like getting scored on was so devastating. We have a team goal. Um, every, like every game we say like no goals in the last, in the first 10 minutes in the last 10 minutes. And so our goal there, like we didn't achieve it. Mm -hmm. So definitely um, losing that goal and then um, losing the game was heartbreaking. And then the, almost the same thing happened against Edgewood yeah. uh, in, in the first game of the year at home, except you ended up winning that game. So it is interesting. That was a big problem last year with the team before you were here. You guys would let up in the last 10 minutes, even if you had a big lead. You know, sometimes that lead would go away because goals would be scored in the last 10 minutes. What do you think? Why do you think that is? Um, partially tiredness mm. um we keep saying like every game we need to pick up our communication because it really helps like for communicating along the lines and just throughout like everybody mm -hmm. needs to be communicating to everybody and so as you get tired or you like your as your mental goes and your physical goes it's just <laughs> the game itself just you kind of lose it so we have to keep up our communication and um I don't know, get more endurance, I guess. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it's probably the elevation change is a little different. You probably went down, right? You are probably in great <laughs> shape coming to St. Mary's, being right there on the Mississippi River. You did score your first Mayak goal against Gustavus Adolphus. You uh, started out the scoring yesterday, one to nothing. You ended up losing the game two to one. But tell me a little bit about that goal. Um. Well, it came right after, so 30 minutes or 30 seconds in. Um, one of the girls on Gustavus broke her arm. So, Oof. yes. So she was on the field for like 10 minutes. So after just playing 30 seconds, we, <laughs> we sat out for 10 minutes. And then um, my goal came about like five or six minutes in. And it just came off of what we had talked about in practice. So we, we do scouting reports on every team um, before games. And then we try to execute on that um, in the game. And so what coach was saying was we need to drive at their back line wide and then switch it to the other side, the weak side, because no one tracks on that side. So that's exactly what we did. Um, Kendall got a cross off on the strong side, and then I was on the back side, and I just hit a volley in. So you're a midfielder, and I i mean, I don't really know that much about soccer. You know way more, way more about soccer than I. Is there a reason that someone with your speed isn't a striker? Um... Well, I guess the striker's responsibility, there should be speed like up top, but that's not the sole responsibility because as at least in our formation, um, the outside mids do a majority of the running and center mids as well, tracking back like um, runners on the outside and then you have to run back up the field to go on the attack. So we're basically playing from like 18 to 18 the whole game. So it's about speed and endurance. Okay. And then the forwards, forwards need speed too. And we do have some quick forwards, but also that's um, like hold up play up top and waiting for everyone to get back. So like stronger players. 
usually are up top. Okay. Jordan Matthews has been one of those stronger players. She's your team leader in goals six, I believe. You're actually second with two. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that, but have you learned anything from the watching the play of Jordan Matthews? Um, she's really she's really good on the ball and she never like gives up on a play. Um she can turn people really quickly and like get in behind their back line and just hit like a really clean shot. Like her shots are the best that I've seen from like anybody. Like they're super consistent and um, her touch is really good. So yeah, I'd say that uh, she's, I think she's really good forward. Um, same with Cassie. Yeah, I would say both. I mean, both are great. They're really fun to watch. I fell in love with the play of Cassie Ariaga last year. Her body control is just remarkable. I, I don't know how she captures some of those <laughs> balls out of the air. It's it's really impressive. What would you say is your greatest quality on the field? My greatest quality? Yeah. Oh. Uh, you don't got to be humble. You don't got to be humble. <laughs> I don't know. Um, maybe trying to connect um, balls in the mid midfield. Like coach wants us to play less direct and just like be swinging the ball and passing more. Okay. So I'd say I try to look for like midfield combination um, or like tracking back runners on the defense. Like, so we play three in the back right now and a lot of my act teams play three up top. So um, the weak side outside mid has to drop back on defense. So I'd say I do a pretty good job of that when necessary. Yeah, and you really got into it with one girl from St. Kate's. <laughs> Does that happen a lot in soccer where there's, like, a one-on-one -on -one matchup throughout a whole game? Yeah, it could. Um, well, like, we, with the scouting reports, sometimes coach says, like, oh, number 15 or number 20, This is these are the players you need to look out for. And sometimes they'll be, like, if they're forwards, then the center um, back usually is, like, the 1v1 person. And the St. Kate's um, game, it just so happened to be an outside forward. So I was on her pretty much the whole game. And yeah, it did get pretty physical and the ref wasn't calling a lot of stuff. So I just, if you get, if the ref's not calling anything, you kind of want to put the other team in their place. So they mm -hmm. know like, Hey, we're here too. And you can't just push us around. So that's kind of what I did at that. Yeah. He wasn't calling a lot until he just began calling yeah. a lot. And Hattie Falkman was on the other end of that. She got two late yellow cards, which led to an ejection and a red card did you say anything to Hattie? Do you know how she was feeling after that game? I mean, I could imagine she probably thought it was all her fault. It wasn't, but. Yeah, she's she's really sad after the game. I saw her when we were all going to line up and coach was like, you have to stay off the field. She just kind of like broke down. I was trying to calm her down, but I knew in the moment, like my words weren't really, really going to do anything. Mm -hmm. So I tried to like say like, hey, it's not your fault. You're good. Like try not to worry about it. But I knew she like. It was all in your head. Like I've been like that before too. Um, the like really frustrating part is the the last yellow card that she got was off of her pulling somebody's jersey, which had just happened to me, mm. and I got the foul for that. <laughs> someone pulled my jersey, I got the foul. She pulls someone's jersey, gets a yellow card. So yeah, it was definitely suspect, and that's in any sport where the ref is calling something all game, and then at the last second he just he or she just switches it up. And it seems to happen a lot more in soccer. Now, don't be specific because I don't want you to get in trouble. But, like, <laughs> what has been the worst time that a ref has really messed with you in a game on any level? Um, I don't even know. Well, hey, maybe that's there's a good thing. So you're, you're a clean player. It's a good thing. Well, there's a lot of questionable refs. <laughs> I mean, I've refed before, too. Okay. Um, Like, just like a summer job. So, I understand, like, it's hard. Mm -hmm. And – but – I don't know. Consistency is the biggest thing with me. Like if you're not going to call fouls and that's fine, but just like stay consistent throughout the game. So we know like how you're going to play. If you're going to call everything, then we'll back off. But if you're going to call one thing mm -hmm. and then the next time that happens and you call, then you don't call it. Like It's just confusing for players and for um, the coaches as well. Absolutely. So you have two games this week, University of Wisconsin Stout and then Augsburg University. So you have one game out of the MIAC to kind of reset, retool, and then you face off against the Augies, who are practically unstoppable. Have you heard of Ashley St. Aubin? No, I have not, but a lot of people have been talking about Augsburg 
and how good they are. Yeah, Augsburg, <laughs> Augsburg, Augies, and Ashley St. Aubin. It's, it's, <laughs> it's got a little flow to it. She scored two goals last year in the 6-0 uh, victory at St. Mary's, and she was the player of the year in the conference. So maybe you should learn a few things <laughs> yeah. from her. She, I mean, I, I would not be surprised if you're just as fast as Ashley St. Aubin because she was the fastest person out there last year. You're pretty quick. Okay. You and Genesis Capasho. Uh, who is faster between the two of you? Oh, I have no clue. Oh, we've come never on. actually we've never actually raced. You gotta and line usually up. we're on the opposite sides of the field. And I don't know. If we did race, I feel like she would be faster in like a shorter distance of time. She has like a good like spurt and I'm I feel like I'm better like as you keep going, I get mm -hmm. faster. I feel like she has a good like first step. So it sounds to me like you should be running track, but I'm not going to push. I'm not going to push. I'm biased a little bit. I am on the track team. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens, <laughs> Nicole Thompson. Thank you so much for sitting in with me here Thank on the squeeze. Me. Hey, you're welcome anytime. And uh, good luck against Stout and Augsburg. Thank you. Okay. We'll be right back after the break. We'll be talking. What, what will we be talking about? We'll be giving you an update about what happened this week in smooth sports. And then coming up at 1050, we will have Frankie Bacalars in studio. We'll be right back. You are listening to The Squeeze with Anthony Pasquazi here on YouTube under the channel name Anthony Pasquazi. If you are watching and you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. Also hit the like and don't be afraid to chime in in the chat. I love talking to you guys, especially when I'm sitting here alone with a microphone directly in my face. <laughs> Thank you to Nicole Thompson. That was great stuff. She really does know a lot about soccer. That was a lot more than... I think most of us do. And uh, it was cool to talk to her about the technicalities within the position of the midfielder. I'm going to probably follow up on a few of those things so that I can learn more and be more educated on the sport. Soccer is not one of my uh, primary sports, but it should be because it's a great sport here at St. Mary's. Both teams got off to slow starts this week in Mayak play, but these games are good. They're good games. They're good losses. You're going to hear me say that a lot talking about these two teams because they're still young. These coaches are still early in their formation of their recruiting plan. So losses like these to quality teams, one, one goal losses, you know, late game losses are good, as good as a loss can be. But 
I'm not mad at them for losing these close games. St. Mary's, the women took on both St. Kate's, who were fourth in the preseason poll, and Gustavus, who were sixth in the preseason poll in the MIAC. Both games ended up in a 2-1 to one loss. St. Kate's was at home. Gustavus was yesterday on the road. I'll read both of the summaries by our sports information director, Donnie Nadeau. Another year, another nail-biter for the St. Mary's University women's soccer team against St. Catherine. And unfortunately for the Cardinals, another heartbreaking loss. A year after the Wildcats dealt the Cardinals a 3-2 setback, scoring 59 seconds into the second overtime, St. Catherine was at it again Tuesday evening in the team's Mayak opener. St. Kate's scored the game-winning goal with one minute 15 seconds remaining in regulation, less than seven minutes after the Cardinals had knotted the game at 1-1, one one, lifting the Wildcats to a 2-1 win over SMU at Okramovich Field. The Wildcats got on the board in the 23rd minute when Sophia Campbell beat goal, Cardinal goalkeeper Gabriella Peterson for her first goal of the season. St. Kate's clung to that one-goal lead until late in the second half before Cassie Ariaga got the Cardinals on the board, scoring off scramble in front of the Wildcat goal to put St. Mary's even at 1-1. to one. The game did not remain deadlocked long, however, as St. Kate's Lauren Witte beat Peterson with the game winner in the 88th minute as the Wildcats handed the Cardinals their first loss of the season. I was there doing the public address announcing, paying attention to the game all the way through. St. Mary's had ball control for much of this game against St. Kate's. Now, St. Kate's had a little bit more of an aggressive offense. They had more shots on goal. Gabriella Peterson had more saves than the than the St. Kate's goalie did. Eight to three in that category. Eight shots for St. Kate's, three for SMU. That's what seems to be the issue with this St. Mary's women's team. They have great ball control, but they don't seem to be able to move the ball up towards the goal. And they barely get shots on goal ever. Jordan Matthews has changed that a bit. She's much more aggressive than Cassie Ariaga. Cassie Ar Ariaga seems to be much more reserved. And also she's dealing with that foot injury that happened earlier in the year. So she's not as fast as she was last year. Hopefully with the healing of that foot, she'll be able to get back up to speed because she is just as lethal, if not more lethal than Jordan Matthews is. So I hope to see her get healthy. And then just yesterday, St. Peter, Minnesota, it seemed only fitting that the St. Mary's University women's soccer team's game against Gustavus, a contest that included a 30-minute injury delay and another 30-minute delay due to lightning, would need a little extra playing time to decide a winner. But Gustavus's Katie Ashpole had other ideas. Ashpole netted her second goal of the game with less than four minutes remaining in regulation. Again, another heartbreaker, lifting the Gusties to a 2-1 to one Mayak win over the Cardinals Saturday at Gusty Soccer Field. St. Mary struck first as Nicole Thompson netted her second goal as a Cardinal, taking a feed from Kendall Archer and a rifling a shot past Gustavus goalkeeper Ashley Becker just seven minutes into the first half. Finally, things are looking good for the Cardinals. Their first Mayak lead of the season the Cardinals would maintain that one goal advantage until the 25-minute mark when Ashpole scored her first goal of the game, beating St. Mary's goalkeeper Gabriella Peterson to not the game at 1-1. One one. That also set up Ashpole's late game, Gusty Heroics. Peterson finished with four saves in goal for the Cardinals, while Becker stopped two of three of St. Mary's shots she faced. Gustavus held a 16-5 advantage in shots attempted, including 6-3 to three in shots on goal. So again, St. Mary's hanging in there, playing bend, not break defense. It looks to me, I didn't watch this game because it was at Gustavus. It seems to me like Gustavus had ball control for much of the game, but St. Mary's was in it all the way through. Bend, not break defense. If they can play more aggressively in the first half, I don't know soccer strategy as much as other sports, but if they can be aggressive in the first half when they have those fresh legs, hopefully build up a little bit of a lead, at least a one goal lead like they did against Gustavus, they lock down, they park the bus, they play bend but don't break defense, which they've shown that they can do so very well, and hopefully that'll be a key to success for this team. They have a lot of athletes, they have Goal scorers, finally. Cassie Ariaga and, and Jordan Matthews, our, they are goal scorers. They are premier goal scorers in this Mayak conference. This team is doing good. They're doing good things. They face off against Augsburg later this week, next Saturday. That's going to be a tough one. They lost to them 6 to nothing last season. 
If they can make it another, you know, one goal loss, hopefully they come out with a victory or a tie. I'll be very satisfied with a, a, a one goal loss. Ashley St. Aubin, she is the best. She's the best athlete in the league for sure. I believe she's a junior this year. So we're still going to have to see her at least until I graduate. And now to the men's side. They also had a rather disappointing Mayak debut. But before that was a stunner against North Central University in which they won the game nine to nothing. Minneapolis, Minnesota, the new St. Mary's University men's soccer team kicks off. Oh, this is the wrong one. <laughs> Never mind. Look at this. This is the airs of doing a show by yourself. St. Mary's nine, North Central one. The St. Mary's University men's soccer team kicks off their MIAC conference play Saturday, and the Cardinals were looking to use Thursday's matchup against North Central as an opportunity opportunity to make sure they were clicking on all cylinders. They are and they were, and then some. St. Mary's erupted for nine, count them, nine goals, including five in the first eight minutes of the second half as the Cardinals rolled to a 9 to nothing non-conference win over the Rams. The Cardinals' nine-goal outburst is their highest offensive showing since scoring 11 times in an 11-1 to win over presentation during the 2013 season. John Luke Nahorski got the Cardinals off and running with a goal at the five-minute mark of the first half, and by the time the half ended, that lead had ballooned to three to nothing, thanks to goals by Josh Balsiger and Eli Zamanski. The halftime break did nothing to slow down the Cardinals' offense, not by a long shot. St. Mary's erupted for five goals in the first eight minutes, which is ridiculous. Two by Garrett Jackson, the freshman. Single tallies by Armin Jesnik and Jacob Clements, not to mention a North Central own goal to push the lead to eight to nothing. Clements would add his second of the afternoon in the 68th minute to round off the scoring and join Jackson in recording his first two, his first collegiate two goal game. St. Mary's held a 25 to one advantage in shot attempts, including a 15 to one cushion in shots on goal. Michael Maniac and Connor Petrick combined on the shutout and goal for St. Mary's with Maniac stopping the Rams lone shot on goal in the first half. Isaac Magisha made six saves in goal for North Central. Uh, dominant is the word. I don't care how poor your opponent is. If they are in Division Three in the NCAA and you trounce them for a nine to nothing victory, that says something about your team. That says a lot about your attackers. It says a lot about your defense. And through six games this year, Every one of them has been a shutout. Of course, the St. Mary's Cardinals are three and three, so they've either been shut out or have shut out their opponent in every game. That script was not flipped when they took on Gustavus yesterday. St. Peter, Minnesota, the St. Mary's University men's soccer team entered its Mayak conference opener against Gustavus with an offense that was hitting on all cylinders. As I just told you, a nine-goal outburst and a nine-to-zero drubbing of North Central just two days earlier would do that to a team. Unfortunately, Cardinal head coach Corbin Bowers probably wishes his team could have pocketed a few of those goals to use against the Gusties Saturday as Gustavus shut down the high-powered St. Mary's offense en route to a 2 to nothing conference win at Gusty Soccer Field. Gustavus goals came from Cole Schwartz, single goals in each half, the first on a penalty kick midway through the first half and the second with 22 minutes remaining in regulation to deal the Cardinals their first conference loss. Sam Morris making his collegiate start. That's a big deal. We'll get back to that in a second. Finished with four saves in goal for the Cardinals, while Wesley Sanders matched that effort with four saves between the pipes for the Gusties. And that's a big deal, remember, because we talked to Corbin Bowers at the beginning of the season by we, I of course mean me, and he told us that he would like to have established a starting goalkeeper heading into Mayak play. And that's exactly what we saw yesterday. Heading into Mayak play, their first game against Gustavus, the freshman, Sam Morris, got the start. He performed well against a team that is high quality. They, I mean, the Gustavus Gusties came into this game. Let me just check it so I get the number correct. They came in with a goal differential of 34-6. to six. 34 goals for and six against. Now, most of those came in non-conference games. Still, you're beating teams by that much. You're a quality soccer team. So Sam Morris stopping a few shots on net in his first Mayak start means a lot for the young man's confidence. I hope to see him out there 
for their game this Saturday against Augsburg. They have a non-conference game on Wednesday at Simpson College. That's in Indianola, Iowa. Simpson College is undefeated this year, and St. Mary's did win their lost their last showing out against them last year, one to nothing. So that'll be a good game. Not necessarily a tune-up, but hopefully give these guys a little more action in a close game. Then they head to Augsburg University. The Augsburg team is just as lethal as the Gustavus team. Their goal differential at the moment is somewhere I'm trying to find it 17 to eight. So again, they've had a very good showing early on in this season. You can feel the energy coming out of me as I'm talking to myself for the last whatever hour that I'm 45. It feels like I've been here for an hour, the last 45 minutes that I've been in here. And now something that we don't do very often, but because Alec is not in the room, we are going to talk about golf. We're going to talk about St. Mary's men's golf, a sport, again, that I don't understand very much, but apparently we've been having a pretty good season thus far. Joe Abdo carded a one over par 73, leaving the sophomore in second place individually to lead the St. Mary's University men's golf team to a seventh place showing after the opening round of the Wisconsin Lutheran Invitational Saturday. Joe Abdo, I had no idea. This coming off of a couple weeks ago, Bryce Galeski, Galuski was Mayak Golfer of the Week, which is remarkable, with I think he shot a 68 or something like that. Uh, I, I'm looking at Frankie back. Lars is in the corner. He doesn't know anything about golf, which is fine because I don't know much either. I tried to get into it a little bit more. I know lower scores are good. So lower 68 sounds good. I'm happy you – okay, so in first grade, I had Miss Eismuller at St. Vincent Fair – Grade school. I almost called it university. Yeah, I went to St. Vincent Fair University as a first grader. And we were playing this math game where it was like golf themed. And whoever we thought that we were playing a game to acquire the most points. And then she hit us with the knowledge that actually, because this is math golf, the lowest score wins the game. So ever since then, I, I learned that golf is lowest score wins. I feel like I did something similar to that in elementary school. Yeah. You never know when you learn things. You just kind of learn things. You just acquire the knowledge. But that's uh, great for Joe Abdo, a second place showing after day one. He's three strokes behind the leader, tied with five other golfers. So hopefully next week we come back and Joe Abdo has a little bit of a crown, uh, uh, winning first place at the Wisconsin Lutheran Invitational. And then finally, another sport that doesn't get very much uh, clout on the squeeze is volleyball. Now, I've been a, a bit upset with how they've played so far this season. They're eight and six and they're zero and one in conference. So the eight and six doesn't really matter. We knew this team wasn't going to nationals, but in conference play, which starts this week, they also didn't look very good. They played their first conference game against Hamlin. They lost in four sets, three to one. There's just something they they're very similar to a team that I talked about earlier that I said I'm never going to talk about again, in that they have so many individual athletes that are uber, uber talented on this team. I mean, Lillian, Braun, Linnea, Wallace, Dana Lynn, Jostic, they're so deep and talented, and it feels like they just haven't put all the pieces together, and that's why they're so frustrating for me personally because I see that they have the potential to make a run to the playoffs through the playoffs, and hopefully win a Mayak championship, which I don't even know the last time that the volleyball team did that. So that's why they're so frustrating to me to watch and to follow because I know that they're better than this. It's not like the soccer teams in which I feel good when they lose because they're still growing. When the volleyball team loses, it's a, it's not a good thing for me because I feel like they shouldn't be losing. It's pretty simple. It's pretty rudimentary. I'm not breaking any ground with this commentary, but let's hope that they do put those pieces together. They got a lot of new coaches on that coaching staff. Let's hope they put the pieces together. They start Mayak play up again, October 2nd against St. Thomas, who we all know how dirty St. Thomas is. In, in the best connotation possible. I meant good when I said dirty. I should probably clear that up. And then they play Bethel, St. Ben's, 
two great teams at the top of the conference every year. It's a tough schedule. St. Thomas, Bethel, St. Ben's. It softens a bit with Concordia, but then you go up back out to Olaf, another quality team. And then you finish with Augsburg, St. Kate's, Carlton, and Gustavus. Those should be four wins. If we're sitting here and this volleyball team is 500 in conference when St. Kate's comes into town on October 26th. They're actually heading to St. Paul. So when we march into town to St. Kate's on October 26th, if this team is 500, I think that they're going to make the playoffs because that tells me that they've put the pieces together and they've made it through a very tough part of their Mayak conference schedule, which is that beginning. That was 100% St. Mary's sports for 20 minutes. I don't know if I've ever done that. That was pre- that was a lot. <laughs> was a little, it was impre- I only did it half of it. It that, was impressive. Thank you, Frankie. That it was a lot of St. Mary's stuff. So it's going to be a little refreshing to talk to Frankie Bacalars after this break. We're going to talk about college football. Finally, we had some good games. We had some ranked opponents going head to head, and Wisconsin destroyed. Michigan, which we all know Frankie Bacalars is going to be very happy about. We'll be right back here on The Squeeze with Frankie after this short break. Thank you so much for listening. You are listening to The Squeeze here with Anthony Pasquazi on YouTube under the channel name Anthony Pasquazi. That's really the only place you can watch it now. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Like I said, we hit 60, which is a big number for us. Uh, You can also hit that like button and chat in the chat. I'll be checking it intermittently through this segment with Frankie Bacalars. If you have a question for Mr. Uh, Frankie Bacalars, our college football expert, I'm sure he'll be happy to answer. I'd love to. He'd love love to to. answer some questions. For sure. This is our expert right here, if you haven't tuned into the show before. Uh, I I think the hair between the two of us, this is the best that the squeeze will ever look. Yeah, because Alex's not here. Because Alex's not here. That's why. Alex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I know. Kind of brings it down a little bit. We've got the hair. The hair. He's got everything else. 
He's, he's got, got the rest of got the, the personality. Looks. He's got the personality. He's got the ability. You know, he's the talent, really. Yeah. I don't like to admit it that much. He's got the swag. The swag. He's, he's got, got the got confidence it. and the swag to him is he, what he's got. He's got it all. So we're missing a lot, but we do have the hair, and we have the college have the football hair. expert in. So Frankie Bacalars, I know what you're going to say. What were your biggest takeaways from this weekend in college football? Um, Wisconsin's a shoe in to be in the Big Ten Championship. Okay. After this weekend. And I, why is that? Ohio, I don't know if they'll beat Ohio State. Uh but because Ohio State, absolutely, they played Ohio, uh, Miami, University, Miami, Ohio, and they won seventy six to six, I think seventy six to three, okay, something yeah. like that. So seventy six to five. <laughs> I think they're a shoe in to be in it. I don't even know how. You, they, was there a safety? I'm like Ohio. I State's, would assume. I would assume Ohio State's like high school team or something. Like that. <laughs> they're fourth stringers. Yeah, they're recruits. They put them in. There must have been. <laughs> but I think I think they're gonna be in it. I mean, Michigan. This was. By far the biggest game so far. Probably will be the biggest game till the Ohio State regular season game. And Wisconsin just absolutely spanked them. I mean, they were up. I think they won 35-14, but they were up 35 nothing. Yep. So I, they spanked them. I think that's huge. Yeah, and we heard from Alec a couple weeks ago, him just being so dissatisfied with the the – love that Michigan gets every single year because yeah. they seem to choke it away every oh. single time. And yeah. here you go again, Michigan football, they were technically the favorites. I know they was in Wisconsin, but mm -hmm. you know, they, they had the better seed or the better AP poll and they get just murdered. I mean, 35 to zero, the game yeah. is over at that point. Yeah. I don't even care about There's the last no two touchdowns. Back. We put, we put our second string, third stringers in, and then they score a couple of touchdowns, but yeah, and who cares? There is this kind of weird existential dread that I think most college football fans and teams have. No matter how good you get, you will not be as good as the Clemsons, the Ohio States, the Georgias, the Alabamas, yeah. but still making it to the Big Ten mm -hmm. Championship – a couple of years ago, we talked about it. Wisconsin was that team that yeah. was way better than every other Big Ten team, mm -hmm. and then they got crushed yeah. in, in the Big Ten Championship. So you never know what's going to happen. And if, if Wisconsin can get in, which it sounds like you think they're going to, I think they're going to yeah. anything can happen in that one game. It's Yeah, I mean, we got in, I think, two years ago my senior high school, and we just got absolutely killed by Ohio State. But I think it's a different team. They're younger. They're, they're really different. You know, They got some different weapons, and – I think even if they give Ohio State a run for their money in it, that's a win in my book. I mean, maybe make a good bowl game, mm -hmm. get a nice bowl win. Be a lot of a lot of um, like confidence going into next season. Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It's all about building blocks, yeah. and and I think the whole idea of bowl games not mattering has hurt college football. Mm -hmm. Because they do matter. Mm -hmm. You know, they matter to the players. They matter to the coaches. They matter to the diehards. They're, they're big things for the programs. Mm -hmm. And I think the issue with the national media and with kind of passive fans is that we don't pay attention to these smaller programs that are, uh, that are making strides every single year. For them, the GoDaddy.com slash I don't know, bowl, <laughs> it, it's a big deal because they get yeah. that win and that helps the recruits and they get to go and they get a, a big package and they get a bunch mm -hmm. of gifts and they, yeah. you know, and they get money for the program. So a bowl game is, is not something Dude, to yeah. stop at. No. Yeah. I remember, gosh, who did Wisconsin play, but they were, they kind of had a mediocre season a couple of years ago and they were in the orange bowl. Mm. I think I can't remember who they played for the life of me and they won. It was the game Alex Hornibrook. Oh, Should have yes. won the Heisman. Yes, yes, yes. And it was huge. I mean, it was like the Orange Bowl. Like, it's not the national championship. It was kind of like, who cares? But it was huge for Wisconsin fans. I mean, people went nuts about it. Yeah. Especially because Alex Hornibrook went off mm -hmm. and then proceeded to have just a terrible season last year. But bowls, bowls matter. Bowls do matter. Uh, the, uh, the Dang it. That would have been the best uh, segue ever if we were talking about the U. What is it? The UFC? No. What are the Bulls? You see, oh. What are the Bulls? The U. Uh, the, ah, this is such. We're going off the rails. Not the UCF. The 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 other Bulls. The other Florida school that are the Bulls. Oh, it's USF. 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 If we yeah. were talking about USF, that would have been a perfect segue, bull to bull. But instead, that was the worst segue ever. And we're going to talk about UCF, which uh, they lost. They lost. And me and Alec had some high expectations for them. So did I. So did you. And uh, 
It's a bummer, man. Yes, it is. Now, I mean, to who? Who they lose they to? They lost to Pittsburgh. Pitt, yeah. They lost to Pittsburgh, who did give Penn State a run for their money two weekends ago. That was an awesome game to watch. Yeah. But, uh, gosh, it makes me so angry yeah. because uh, you see – Because now they're out the window. Now it's They're not, out the window, yeah. It's just and not going to happen. And their whole streak is over. Yeah. And, you know, it's all – it, they have no shot of making a big no. bowl game, which is unfortunate because I really like the swag. I like the idea of them having a shot and showing their medal, testing their medal against the big boys. And now they're never going to get that shot. And I, I, I feel the air being let out of the bag a little bit mm -hmm. with that program. Yeah, I, I, the hype is gone. It's got to be low morale there right yeah. now. Yeah, for sure. Losing to Pitt at home, I believe. Losing to Pitt. No, losing on the road. So they lost by one point, 35 to 34 on the road against Pittsburgh. If this was a different situation, you could say, hey, if that was Alabama and they lost by one point to an unranked opponent on the road, you'd say, well, they're probably going to make it back in because we know that they're good. Oh, yeah. UCF had zero, zero margin for error. And sadly, that margin for error is gone. Uh, another good victory or a good loss, I would say, as a Notre Dame fan happened mm -hmm. last night, and that was – them losing against number three, Georgia. Number seven, Notre Dame, losing to number three, Georgia, in Georgia. Really close game, though, yeah. Really close game by six points. Yeah. They had a they had a 14 to nothing lead, I do believe, so that was unfortunate to see. But I, I called my grandma before the show because she's a huge Notre Dame fan. Her late husband played for Notre Dame, which is why I'm a big Notre Dame fan. Uh, and we just talked about the idea of a good loss. So what's your opinion on the idea of a good loss? You know, I think um, if you play well, I mean, if you play well, if you play a good team and get give them a run for their money, you know, that's a good loss to me. If you improve on what you were doing wrong weeks previous, I think that's a good loss. If you're just getting better and I kind of, even though you lose, if you still feel on the right track, mm -hmm. I think that signifies a good loss. I think that's what that means. Yeah. And I mean... Obviously, Georgia's a really good team. Notre Dame's a really good team, too. I didn't even know they were top 10 until you just said that. But, you know, just giving them a run for their money, losing by six, you know, at their place, kind of shutting up the Georgia fans a little bit. I think that's a good loss. Yeah, definitely. Um, Notre Dame, they – uh, it's so it's like being a Cubs fan. I mean, it's really like being a fan of any team. You have all these expectations for them every single year because they're ranked in the top 10 of every single preseason yeah. AP poll because it is Notre Dame. And sometimes it's more of the name than the substance and the team kind of sucks. But these last few years, the team has been very quality. They made yeah. the playoff last year. They lost 30 to three in the net in the semifinal against Clemson. So it's really good to see them play a team of that upper echelon, which I would say is it's probably Clemson, Alabama, and then Georgia, Ohio State. Yeah. And now I will put Notre Dame in that third kind mm -hmm. of tier. Clemson's alone, and then you have Alabama who's alone, and then you have this, this next tier. So it was good to see them lose to a team mm -hmm. that good in the fashion that they did. That's what I was and kind of speaking of that when you're talking about St. Mary's sports earlier, I was actually talking to Josh Balzinger last night. And you talked about their hard loss, mm -hmm. but I was talking to him and he he said, you know, we lost to nothing, but I'm really happy about yeah. how he plays. Like everybody's learning. It was the freshman first conference game. They had a lot of freshmen playing. He was like, I'm really happy about how we lost. Like he said the goals were kind of ref related, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah. One of them was a penalty yeah. kick. Yeah. So <laughs> he goes, I'm really happy about it. Just kind of. Sticking with that theme. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for sure. I said it earlier. Sam Morris starting his first mm -hmm. game in yeah. goal as, as a freshman. That's huge. Mm -hmm. And then losing to a team that came in with a goal differential over 30. Yeah. I mean, that, it's a big deal sometimes when you lose a game yeah. in a good fashion. It's, mm -hmm. it's bizarre to say, and it, it almost sounds a little millennial to, yeah. to say, okay, yeah. you know, we lost, but it's okay. It's not yeah. that big of a deal. You know, it's not the it's but, win or nothing, win or go home. But there is I mean, something if the wheels take. if the wheels aren't off the bus, you're. I think you'll be fine. Yeah, for sure. Wheels being off the bus that would be a good segue into Antonio Brown's brain. Yeah, 
at the moment. Exactly. Uh, Antonio Brown was released from the Patriots after playing one game. His guaranteed money has been voided. His guaranteed $10 million from the Patriots was voided. His guaranteed $40 million from the Raiders was voided earlier in the season, two weeks ago. What in the world is going on in that man's brain, Frankie Bacalars? I feel like the NFL has just turned into like keeping up with the Kardashians. A little bit. Like There's just drama everywhere. Antonio Brown has had a very rough two weeks, all self-induced, all his fault. Um, you know, it's just you have to let him go. Mm-hmm. There's just too much. I He obviously played really well last Sunday, and that, that's great, and it's great to have a good player, but at what point does it just hurt the team so much to have him in the locker room mm-hmm. that you have to let him go? If I were Bill Belichick, yeah, he'd be, he'd be gone. I don't care who he is. I would even – He's not getting his money, but mm-hmm. even I would pay him to leave. <laughs> That's how much you don't want him in the locker it's room. It's just toxic. He's a toxic person. I mean, if you post a video on Twitter of you running around your backyard <laughs> celebrating getting released by a team because you hated them so much – that's just it's I, a didn't bad like, look. I didn't like that video it's, at it's, all. Yeah, it's a bad look for sure. And I talk about this with Cody Michaels all the time. Cody Michaels, uh, assistant track coach here at St. Mary's, huge Pittsburgh fan, mm-hmm. uh, deep seated roots in Pittsburgh. And the fall from grace of Antonio Brown has been a spectacle. I mean, it he was unrecruited in high school. He was barely, I mean, he was undrafted in the NFL. He he wasn't drafted by any team. And then he ascended. He worked his way to becoming one of the greatest wide receivers of all time, ability wise. Now, not production wise because of this off the rails activity lately, but to watch that ascent from nothing, I mean, a poor mm-hmm. household, not recruited, not drafted to becoming a number one wide receiver in the NFL and, and being a part of a Super Bowl team, correct or no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Being a part I'm of a Super sure, Bowl yeah. team to now this. I still suspect, and this is unfounded, uh, I still suspect that it has something to do with repeated hits to the head, which is a scary mm-hmm. subject to talk yeah. about. Because how else does a man go from being a, a humble, hardworking you know, mm-hmm. wide receiver to having one of the biggest hubris I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. You know, how does that just coin flip in one season? Because he wasn't a problem no. two seasons ago no. for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Absolutely. He never caused waves or anything. Never. And then I think maybe I think a lot of it he feels entitled to it now because he takes the hard hits all the time because he's making the plays. I think he just feels very entitled to all everything he wants, which is ridiculous because he wants some ridiculous things yeah but i think it's just entitlement for him i think he feels like he deserves all this and maybe he deserves a lot of it because he's a really good player you Mm -hmm. know he came from nothing and he worked his way up which is american values right there yeah it's the american dream yeah american dream and he just feels entitled to it you know he wanted his helmet which that even that was (laughs) ridiculous to me but Whatever, it's just him being a diva, I guess, and whatever. But everything was just crazy to me. And then his injury where he wasn't playing. I actually watched the first couple episodes of Hard Knocks when he was with the Raiders. Mm -hmm. And it was just like he didn't seem that, like, crazy on the show. And all of a sudden the news just blew up about him. I'm not playing if I don't get my helmet. Yeah. You know. I mean, a lot of that has to do with uh, Hard Knocks being – well curated yeah. by the Raiders, what I think is the stupidest thing in the world. I mean, it's practically directed by the Raiders. They're not going to yeah. give you anything. And that's why I don't really watch Hard Knocks anymore because yeah. I think it's, uh, it's, it's just it's too pristine yeah. and it's not as undercover as it used to be because now we get all the undercover stuff from Twitter and we actually yeah. hear from the athletes and we can learn about well, So they actually, they didn't even put him getting released on the show. There you go. I mean, and people were super mad about it. Like they didn't even like, they mentioned it, I guess. I didn't watch that far into like, mm-hmm. the season, but they mentioned it. But people wanted to see it. You know, people wanted to see him probably go in the office and break a laptop or something <laughs> like that. Yeah, or, like, or so, celebrate because yeah. he's so happy. <laughs> yeah, and they just didn't show it, which leads you to believe like something crazy might have happened That's in that true. office when yeah. he got released. That could be true. Uh, so this is the last thing we'll talk about before I get you out of here. I'm going to talk at 11:30 about player empowerment and how it kind of it leads to a a polarizing kind of 
place in sports fandom where you have some fans on the side of the owners, which personally I find absurd. And then you have some fans on the side of the players. I don't know what side you take, but it's sad to see this situation for those of us like myself who are on the sides of the players. He is a terrible poster child yeah. for player empowerment. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, what do you think about that? I'm with, I'm with the players too. I mean, I think the players are the ones doing it. They're the ones playing. They're the ones taking the hard hits every week. I think they should have a bigger say on team stuff mm -hmm. and just NFL stuff in yeah. general. But yeah, I agree that Ant Antonio Brown is not a good example of what an NFL player should be. And it's sad because he's getting the most publicity right mm -hmm. now. So people kind of think they see Antonio Brown and they're like, oh, so that's what an NFL players like. They're exactly. divas. They're he's a diva, so they're yeah, all divas. Exactly. And I think that's why I would get rid of them because you don't want that even because now the Patriots already have a bad rap. People don't like the Patriots. Mm -hmm. Either you like them or you don't. And having him on the team made it worse because people really do not like Antonio Brown. You know? So I think he's yeah, he's a terrible poster child to have for NFL players, but he's getting the most publicity. So yeah, it's a it's a ugly situation for sure. This situation has been ugly, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, no Liam, Alec. <laughs> no Alec. Oh, jeez. Uh, I hope he's not watching. Liam Boyle will be in studio, freshman on the men's soccer team at eleven fifteen. After this short break, Frankie, is there anything else that you want to say? Anything that your heart desires to say? Roll cards. Roll cards, baby. We'll be right back. Thank you so much for listening to the squeeze.
You are listening to The Squeeze with Anthony Pasquazi on YouTube under the channel name Anthony Pasquazi. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Thank you to Frankie Bacalars. We don't have, that's a great looking kit. Brandon, Braden Schneider. Yep. Uh, that's a great looking kid. Is that uh, a friend of friend, Liam Boyle? Friend from back home, yes. Friend from back home. I absolutely love it. And oh, look at that. Wally Barrows just subscribed to the channel. See, this this man has been supportive of the squeeze. This man is Liam Boyle. He's been supportive of the squeeze before he even got to St. Mary's. He put the thing up on the uh, on the Instagram page, and now now I'm getting I'm just getting so many so much love. So you you get Liam Boyle on the show, and he gets you some followers. So Liam Boyle, you're from Westchester, Illinois. I know it well. You went to Naz. I went to Fenwick. Uh, how did the Fenwick Naz rivalry happen in your career over there? So for soccer. We were one and one, but you guys won the game that really mattered. But of course, we did. One of the most favorite games of my high school career was the one we actually beat you guys. Oh yeah, because PK shootout. There were a bunch of fans there. It was one of the best games I've ever been a part of. But every other sport, I think we had your number because we didn't play in basketball. So. No, that's true. Yeah. We were we were best in basketball. Naz, known for your football, you were yeah. you were very good in football. Very good in a lot of things. Very good. track. How's the track team over at Naz? Our Academy? track team. I don't. I don't think we're bad. I just don't know okay. how highly ranked we were. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, let, okay, glory days. Who, who cares about yeah. high school glory days? Yeah. It's fun to talk about, but we're here to talk about St. Mary's sports primarily and solely St. Mary's soccer. This is your first season. You have yet to get in the score column, scoring column, yeah. but you have had a good amount of playing time. Did you play at all against Gustavus yesterday? Yeah, I played – think over 30 minutes yesterday because one Henry Kelly went down. Oh, really? I stepped in at center back. So hopefully he gets back soon. Okay. I hope he gets back yeah. soon. Do you know, uh, can you speculate at all? Do you even want to comment? I, when I first saw it, I thought it was his foot, but someone said it was his shin. Okay. So well, I know he was in a boot afterwards, but uh, I don't like hearing that. I didn't yeah. know that. So Henry Kelly, for those of you who don't know, sophomore, and he is a linchpin of uh, pretty much everything that the Cardinal soccer team does. So hopefully he gets out there. But next man up, that next man is Liam Boyle. Uh, how was it being out there for your first Mayak game? Um, it was like a, it was such a blur because there, the whole preseason, everyone was just hyping up like how Mayak was going to be a different beast than non-conference. When I got out there, I was just so focused on doing my job. And as Coach Bowers always says, doing 50% of the job to the man next to you. Mm. So I was just focused on that, not really just like being like, oh, I'm in the Mayak right now. So I think that really helped that I was kind of just thrown in there because I didn't have time to work <laughs> or anything or yeah. really think about the situation. So I think that helped, but. And uh, Gustavus, we talked about it a couple times today. They came in absolutely destroying teams all non-conference season long. They're now 2-0 in the MIAC. You guys did uh, a little bit of domination of the night before or the couple nights before against North Central. Did you get into that game at all? Yeah, I played probably about 35 to 40 minutes that game. I played left back and center back with... Uh, the freshman, Garrett Jackson, who scored two goals. That's awesome. That was a fun sight to see. But, yeah, that was just a fun game where learning experiences because uh, they played a different style than most teams. They went really high press. Mm. So it was easier to build all the back, find our midfielders and let them do what they do best. And that's what uh, Coach Bauer has been preaching all preseason season. So. I mean, nine goals against any yeah. team is definitely a <laughs> definitely yeah. a confidence booster, and one of them being an own goal. I I didn't watch the game sadly. I wish I did. But could you uh, tell me what happened in that own goal? Uh, so Zach Bracken was driving it down the line, and he we call it bangu, but for most people, you just drop it like into the box. And I was on the bench at that time, so I didn't really get a clear angle. But I think it just hit off. One of their players. Okay, so. just went right in the goal. Yeah, that's not that. Does, that's definitely not a good feeling. Uh, so your next game out in the Mayak is against Augsburg, but before that, you take on Simpson College, who's who has a high quality program. Have you looked at the scouting report at all for Simpson College? No, we probably will on Monday. But last night, a lot of the guys were talking about. I think they beat us last year, mm -hmm. one but, to nothing. Yeah, one to nothing, and I think we have a stronger team this year, okay. a lot more depth. So it'll be a good game to see and be a part of. 
Yeah, and it looks like in a lot, like it could just be the fact that it is not conference, but you guys look bigger than yeah. a lot of the teams that you play against. Is that just a non conference thing, or is that going to carry over into the MIAC? I I don't know. I've never mm-hmm. played MIAC before, but I know like St. John's is a really big team. They recruit six footers only. Okay. So I don't know if we'll, I feel like we'll be bigger on the bigger side against most teams, but I don't know if that'll be a consistent thing where. We have a lot of big guys. Yeah. And uh, so the goalie situation, the goalie competition has been a big story so far in the non-conference play. Uh, the freshman, Sam Morris, got the start. My roommate. It, your roommate. Look at that. That's awesome. Didn't even know that. He got the start against Gustavus. Uh, I don't want you to speak for Corbin, but do you think Sam Morris is going to continue to get those not or those conference starts? Uh, I think he played well, but all four of our goalies – play extremely well every time they have their opportunity. So I think Coach Bowers might go with a hot hand. I, okay. He hasn't really spoken on what he's going to do with the goalies, at least not to the non-goalies. The non-goalies, yeah. yeah the, the, the guys who don't really need yeah. to know, right? Uh, okay, so you're a sports management accounting major. What do you think you want to do with that? Um, big picture, either work for the NCAA, a high school athletic director, who I think would be a really fun job. Mm. Or just work for you know SEC, Big Ten, one of those big time conferences. So basically, you don't care what you do; you just want to be in. I sports. just want to be in sports. Don't want to leave it yet. So, is soccer your favorite sport? Uh soccer's. It's my favorite sport to compete at because I think growing up, I was never like the soccer kid. I was the baseball kid, and then going into high school, I realized I wasn't very good at baseball. <laughs> played two years but then I always was one of the bigger kids in soccer kind of came more naturally to me so and I just love playing because that's what my best friends playing played it growing up so just figured might as well keep it going junior year I was reaching out to a lot of schools my parents went here so same area oh really yeah okay so same areas was an obvious choice and then the rest is kind of history. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. I'm happy you're here. I'm happy you're sitting here with me right now. Have you ever seen the movie Moneyball? Yes. Yeah. We're, what? We're all told that we can no longer play the children's game. Yep. Some of us are told at 12. Some of us are told at 40, but yep. we're all told. <laughs> I went through the same thing as you did. In grade school, baseball was my sport. And then I realized <clears throat> I'm not very good. <laughs> I'm not very good at this sport. I'm going to go run track. Yeah. <laughs> Something that requires zero hand-eye coordination because that's what I have. Now, you guys, I mean – I used to have a fight with my cross country coach, uh, Coach Winnick, at Fenwick High School all the time because he would say that soccer players are the best athletes out there because they use something in their feet that no other athletes really have to use. Well, well you throw your hat into the ring. What do you think? I think so. I'm gonna be a little biased because I've always grown up with hockey friends. I know mm. they're just great athletes because they don't have they don't use all the body parts like we do. I still think they're great athletes. Basketball are fantastic athletes. You know, I think soccer is really up high up there in the world rankings of best athletes. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, what you guys can do with your feet yeah. is probably more than I could do with my hands, like with a soccer ball. So I am impressed every time I see you guys do something. And just the idea of curving a soccer ball, having the ability to curve a soccer ball like a baseball with your foot is just mind blowing to me because I'm still at the point where I'm toe kicking. Yeah. I, I just, I kick the ball and it goes any direction. So to see you guys finally tune things like that is mm-hmm. just really fun to see. So good luck out there against Simpson college over in Iowa. That'll be a fun one. And then Augsburg, I haven't done much scouting of Augsburg. How quality of a team are they? I don't know if they're still nationally ranked. I know oh, wow. a week ago they were top 10. I know there's a lot of, friends from kids on our team that go there okay so every now and then i'll hear oh augsburg beat this team by this much or they lost this game but i think it'll be a good game just solely because they're my ex school Mm -hmm. probably made the tournament last year so i think that'll be another good uh test and battle yeah and we've been talking about good losses all show long hopefully we come out with a good victory yes. against the augsburg augies over at okromovic Okr- field this saturday i'll be out there you'll be out there and hopefully we come home with a roll cards w 
Thank you, Liam Boyle, for sitting in with me. And thank you to all of you who are listening back home on YouTube. We'll be right back with the squeeze. You are listening to The Squeeze here on YouTube with Anthony Pasquazi. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. I think we're up to 61 now, so we're climbing up there. Some comments in the chat. Great to hear about Smooth Sports. More alumni should be watching. I agree, Mr. Bacalars. It would be great if we had more Smooth alumni watching, but I'm not going to complain. We have as many viewers as we have. I'll, I'll enjoy the company of every one of you. And then Ryan Fleming, great interview, Ant. You know you can thank your father for that hand-eye coordination. Yeah, we all know where the athleticism comes from in the family. And uh, sadly, half of it came from him. <laughs> just kidding, Dad. <laughs> I'm a great athlete in some respects, just not with the hand-eye coordination. But back to the money ball thing. I, uh, I watched the movie last night for the whatever time, 25th time, I think, in my life. It, uh, it's pretty much always been my favorite movie, definitely my favorite sports movie. And I'll throw it on just as background noise a lot of the time. And uh, I had a, a memory jogged in my head yesterday when Brad Pitt, who's playing Billy Bean, is walking around with a spit cup because he's chewing tobacco. Uh, I first saw the movie when I was in grade school, and I didn't really understand that. This is a little embarrassing. I didn't understand that that paper cup was him chewing tobacco and then spitting you know, the spit out in the cup. So I went to school the next day, and again, this is remarkably embarrassing. And I went to school the next day and I brought a paper cup. <laughs> I brought a paper cup and I just began spitting in it uh, like I was Billy Bean or Brad Pitt because I just thought he was the coolest cat out there. Uh, so I began to do it and I did it for about an hour and a half. And then maybe my stupid little young brain realized how dumb I looked and I ceased to do the spit cup. And now looking back on it and realizing how, how kind of goofy I was, it's hilarious that a little sixth grader or whatever I was, was pretending to chew tobacco in class and teachers were just okay with it. But uh, yeah, so it's funny the things that you pick up as a child and then realize how silly you looked <laughs> as an adult looking back on said childhood. Uh, there you go. A little insight into the brain of a 11, 12 year old Anthony Pasquazi. We're done talking smooth sports for the most part. 
today. This is some of the most uh, heavy, smooth sports stuff that we've ever done. I'm looking to turn the show in that direction for the most part, just because that's 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 what most people want to hear. I say it pretty much all the time. Not a lot of people want to hear a 20 year old who doesn't know anything and has had zero experiences in the world talk about sports because there are professionals out there who do it on a daily basis and they get paid to do it, believe it or not. But there's nobody out there other than Alec and I and then Donnie Nadeau and the Cardinals Nest that are talking solely smooth sports. So that's the direction that we're moving the show in. And as I say that, I directly contradict myself (laughs) and begin to talk nothing else but about professional sports. This is a a long-winded video essay. Now, I didn't script it, but I do have some points that I want to make. We're going to start talking about the NBA. We're going to move into player empowerment. And then we're going to finish with the idea of there no longer being drafts in professional professional sports. So if you have opinions at all about these kind of controversial topics, I want you to put them in the chat because this is where I want to have a conversation with you and really use this as a radio sports radio show platform. Normally you can take calls. We used to be able to take calls and it was great because I got to hear, you know, your arguments for, for points that I made against. Um, we're going to try and do that here. It's a little different. It's a little delayed. You're what? five seconds, 10 seconds delayed of what I'm actually saying. So it's not going to be totally interactive. But if, you, if you're if calling me on my BS, please do so in the chat. I was sitting with coach Nick Larson, another assistant track coach here at St. Mary's. And I was sitting in his office and we just started talking about the NBA. And I said, look, I get it. They're some of the greatest athletes in the world. But I, for some reason, cannot appreciate NBA basketball on the same level that I appreciate NFL football or MLB baseball. And I kind of, you know, just opened up my brain and began to think, why? Why is that so? And I came to this point. It's not the cliched, oh, everyone always wins in the in the NBA, or the one team always wins. You always know who's gonna win. That's not even it. That's part of it. But the main thing for me is it feels like there are a group of 10 players in the NBA who have just mastered the game of basketball. And that's unlike any other sport. There's no sport like it, at least that I watch, that I follow, in which one player can solely win the entire game for a team. And that is something that Giannis Antetokounmpo, James Harden, LeBron James, Kevin Durant, the list goes on. There's about 10 of them. They can do that on any given night. And for some reason, that really turns me off to NBA basketball because I I like the idea of a team game or a, a game in which it's not pre- predestined. You don't know who's going to win. I'm not talking about in the big picture where oh, the Warriors and the Cavaliers, they're going to win every year. I'm saying on a game-to-game basis – If I'm watching the Bulls and they're playing the Orlando Magic, I can say, huh, that's a good game, but they're two terrible teams. If the Bulls are playing a great team with one of those 10 players that are basically cheat codes, I can say with 90% certainty that the Bulls are going to get obliterated or at least are going to lose a close game. And for some reason, that leads me to not be able to even sit down and watch an NBA game. Then you have the other side of the argument of people who say they don't like the NBA. There are fewer and fewer of them every single year. The NBA is the fastest growing entity in sports at the moment. That's where most of the money is going. Those broadcasts are going for billions and billions of dollars. The NBA may never topple the NFL as the number one sports property in the United States, but it's definitely giving the NFL a run for its money, something that hasn't been done in pretty much ever. So the other argument about people who don't like the NBA is this player empowerment thing. I've never understood the idea of a fan rooting for an owner, rooting for a billionaire instead of rooting for a millionaire or a player. If you, if you want to look at it, you can say, well, there might be a little bit of envy there an owner you look at an owner and you say hey i could be a billionaire because they don't really have any talent they just have a lot of money the player i could never be lebron james and i understand that and that could lead me to being a a jealous 
you know, envious person. And that's why I don't want them to have any power because I don't identify with them. I identify with these billionaires. And I'm laughing as I say it because it sounds ridiculous, but it's what a lot of fans will say. And they say, well, the NBA is boring because the players don't stay with one team and they have all the power and I just can't take it anymore. And now the NFL is moving in that direction. You see Antonio Brown, who is a bad poster child, but you see Jalen Ramsey, you see OBJ, Le'Veon Bell, Khalil frickin' Mack. They empowered themselves by locking themselves out or by requesting a trade publicly, by forcing the hand of the owner. They gave themselves the ability to finally pick where they play their game at and and that leads to the final part of this which is an nfl draft or an mlb draft or an nba draft is a little sickening if you really think about it and here's my idea to stop the idea of a draft happening, which is just gross. It, it, it just sounds gross to me, the idea of drafting players and owning players. It, there's some weird connotations that we're not going to get into that you could probably hear where I'm going. But the idea of it being one of the only jobs in the world or in the United States in which you get out of college and you are not allowed to pick where you go to work. I mean, imagine if I'm done here at St. Mary's and I get my two degrees and I really want to get into radio and I have zero say in where I get to get into radio at. That's kind of how it works, but that's a, a story for another day. I wouldn't really want to get into radio anymore if you told me that I had to go live in uh, Juneau, Alaska. Now, Juneau is great, but it's not exactly where I want to live. It's... It, it, and no, no jobs are like that. You get to pick where you live. You get to pick where you work. And there are a lot of factors. In, in sport, there are none of those factors. And it's a little bit sickening. It, 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 it releases, relinquishes all the power from the players to the ownership. And it's good to see players finally getting that power back. So here's what I'll what I'll say. And this is, let's just say, let's just use the NFL because it's already kind of like this. I think in the NFL, and I, I, I would put this in all of the sports, we're just using the NFL as, as an example, make all of the teams have to pay the same salary for ever, or the same salary cap for every team. Whether that be a floor or a ceiling, they have to hit it. They have to hit that number every single year, which means no team will have an advantage financially to go out and sign these players from college. Because that's the argument that you always hear is, well, if there's no draft, there will be absolutely no parity. So what I'm saying is the best players are going to get the most money and the best teams are going to be the teams in which use their allo they allocate their finite resources in the best way. If you have the Bears and they go out and sign three of the best recruits from college three years in a row, well, their, you know, their money is going to be lesser than the Packers who haven't signed those three players yet. So maybe the Bears are going to be very successful over those next three seasons, but then the Packers finally start getting those guys. And it it'll even the playing field so much more in my mind if we just only let teams have $300 million. Every team has $300 million. The poor teams, the rich teams, they all have to spend that amount of money. The teams that are the best will be the teams that allocate those resources in the most efficient way. Just how it works already in the NFL. The Patriots are the Patriots because they draft really, really well. That will be no different when you add money into the situation and you just say, what are the teams that use money the most efficiently? Well, if, it, if that's the Patriots, they're going to win their eight Super Bowls in a decade or their six Super Bowls in a decade. It'll be no different, but it will give players the ability to finally choose where they work. Some players like Antonio Brown, who is clearly a diva, will only follow the money. And maybe the Buffalo Bills offer him $60 million, a crazy, what, 20%? 
that would be 30% of their payroll to one player. And no other team is offering him $60 million. He can decide to go to Buffalo, never win anything, play in the cold, but at least he made that decision. And I guess that's where I finished this crazy rant that really had no point is I want players to decide where they live. I want players to decide where they work. I want players to have the power. The the, the whole team identity thing, the, the tribalism that is surrounded in sport is dying a little bit. Now, I still have my teams, but the younger generation I have noticed, and I've talked to a few, very anecdotal, but I've talked to a couple younger kids, and I'll, I'll ask them who their favorite teams are. And I've heard this a remarkable amount of times. They'll say, well, I don't really follow teams. I follow players. So if that's where the younger generation is going and they're just simply following players because they can do that on Twitter, on Instagram, they can connect with players on a level that they can no longer connect with teams at. So if we build these players as their own enterprises, which they already kind of are, and we give them finally the power to choose where their enterprise goes, it'll be great for the growth of the NFL. It'll be great for the growth of these players. And I think it'll be great for the growth of fan bases because no longer will a fan who lives in Buffalo have to suffer forever and only love the Buffalo Bills. If we center it more around the player and being a fan of the player, a Buffalo fan can fall in love with Jimmy Garoppolo and then follow him for his 15-year career. And then they can also fall in love with Odell Beckham Jr. and 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 be a fan of him for his 10-year career. It. Ah, I wish I had a landing point. If I was professional, I would have a landing point. I hope you see where I'm going. And if you have a question, please comment in, in the chat below. And this is where I wish I had somebody to bounce my ideas off of. Normally, Alec Root is in here. And um, this is not it, – it, it, I okay. Thank you for listening to The Squeeze with Anthony Pasquazi. This has been a, a great, a great show. Nicole Thompson was awesome. Liam Boyle was, uh, Boyle was awesome. Frankie Backlars, great as always. Phenomenal hair. That was a poorly worded rant that I hope you got the point of. Thank you for listening to The Squeeze with Anthony Pasquazi. We will be back next week. Hopefully, Alec will be sitting here uh, listening to my poorly worded rants along with yourselves. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button. And thank you so much for listening. Oh, brother. Uh -oh.